Uh, welcome everyone to this next session um, of Brit Spine 2021. Uh, my name is Ed Seal. Uh, I'm an orthopedic spinal surgeon from uh, Stoke Mandeville in Buckinghamshire. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Richard Nelson for this next talk. Uh, Rick is a leading uh, consultant neurosurgeon with over 35 years of experience, having trained at the Wessex Neurological Centre in Southampton. Uh, he served uh, previously as the president of the SBNS, uh, chair of the Joint Neurosciences Council, and also chair of the Neurosurgery SAC. Along with his vast experience of skull-based tumor surgery, he has a subspecialty interest in the management of spinal conditions in elite sports men and women, with uh, providing uh, spinal surgical services to national rugby unions, uh, premiership clubs, Olympic associations, with probably the largest practice and experience in treating rugby spinal injuries, and in particular, cervical injuries in the UK. So, I think we've got uh, 54, but when we to past 11, without further ado, I'd like to invite Rick to speak on the management of spinal disorders in rugby players. Good morning, and welcome to this session of Brit Spine 2021. I've been asked to talk about cervical disorders in professional rugby union players. But first, uh, an historical aside, why Webb Ellis Neck and who was Webb Ellis? During his lifetime, it appears that he was a relatively obscure clergyman. He died a bachelor in the south of France in 1872. There's no doubt that he attended rugby school as a foundationer for nine years between 1816 and 1825. Uh, he was clearly academic, obtaining a scholarship to Brasenose College in Oxford. He was also recognized to be a good cricketer. But as this statue at rugby school demonstrates, he achieved his worldwide fame through the infamous exploit of picking up a football and running with the ball to the opposite try line. So this uh, fine uh, disregard for the rules of football is commemorated in a uh, stone plaque on the walls of rugby school. Unfortunately, like so many uh, great sporting legends, this is almost certainly a myth. The first account of the exploit is found in the rugby school magazine by one Matthew Bloxham, but this was several years after Webb Ellis had died uh, with no means of corroborating the story. This uh, did not stop the organizing committee of the first Rugby World Cup sourcing this iconic gold cup uh, originally made in London in 1906 and then naming it the Webb Ellis Cup. It can be seen here with the 2003 uh, England team. Now, what I'd like to point out is that even then, and this is just nine years after elite rugby union had turned professional, a significant number of the players that you can see in this photograph had already undergone cervical spine surgery. So uh, what, what has been the impact of uh, William Webb Ellis's misdemeanors on the necks of our rugby players? The public associates rugby with serious cervical spine injuries, and they do occur, but fortunately they're now relatively rare. This is a, a study from Simon Kemp and colleagues involving a two season prospective cohort from 12 premiership rugby clubs with over 500 professional players. And you can see that although there were no catastrophic injuries, uh, three players suffered career ending injuries. The overall uh, event of spinal problems is equivalent to one injury every two, two and a half games. And of the 4,000 days lost to training and competition, 
15% uh, were due to cervical nerve root injury. In addition to acute injuries, uh, we have to deal with the implications of structural problems such as ligamentous laxity and congenital stenosis. But these are relatively uncommon. And the biggest problem that professional rugby union players now face is the condition that I refer to as hypertrophic cervical spondylopathy, giving rise to both radiculopathies and myelopathies. And so what is HCS? Essentially, it is a form of accelerated cervical spondylosis due to sustained and repetitive axial loading, both in training and play. It's now detectable in academy players, and it starts to become common in the second half of a player's career, particularly affecting the forwards and the front row. The imaging findings are quite characteristic. Um, the mid and lower cervical vertebrae become uh, hypertrophied and distorted. We see uh, end plate thickening and uh, sclerosis with similar sclerosis involving the pedicles and posterior elements. And these changes together with early uh, marginal osteophyte formation uh, result in this uh, typical smooth uh, concentric foraminal stenosis. Another interesting feature of uh, HCS is the relative preservation of uh, disc height and signal in these young players. The underlying pathophysiology is almost certainly an adaptive a hypertrophic response to the axial loading of the spine combined with repetitive microtrauma sustained during contact play. So in contrast, similar changes are much less frequent in rugby league players who are not subject to competitive scrums or in other power sports such as weightlifting where the uh, unpredictable contact stress is absent. Uh, these are uh, the MRI scans of a 20-year-old hooker, and they nicely demonstrate the early hypertrophic change occurring at C67 with this rather uh, bulbous facet joint hypertrophy and a right foraminal stenosis. The muscle definition is uh, striking, and, and I think it gives uh, a, a sense of the loads that are being imposed on these players next. Um, and here, the extent of the bony stenosis um, with osteophyte formation is, is well demonstrated on parasagittal bony reconstructions. So the question is how best to deal with this foraminal stenosis once it becomes significantly symptomatic. Um, in, in simple terms, there are two options, either anterior or posterior approaches. And the arguments uh, for and against the two approaches have been extensively rehearsed. And of course, they apply to all of our cervical spine patients. But the biomechanical considerations are, I believe, of much greater importance when considering interventions in young elite athletes. This is what uh, we should avoid, if at all possible. A 33-year-old prop forward undergoes a C67 discectomy and plating for an isolated right C7 radiculopathy. He plays on for two or more seasons until the onset of a myelopathy becomes a career-ending problem. The myelopathy then progresses 
And a year later, at the age of 37, he has to undergo a two-level discectomy with disc replacements. And in cases like this, which started to become more common in the late 1990s, uh, which have fundamentally influenced my surgical practice. Um, now, of course, we do see players with an early or threatened myelopathy where an anterior approach is going to be the only safe option. But for all other players presenting with a, a, a radiculopathy, I believe that posterior microsurgical approaches are the surgical management of choice. I adopted that strategy, strategy just over 20 years ago, having spent a couple of years uh, refining my surgical approach using oblique undercutting and uh, facet sparing microforaminotomies. Um, since then, I've operated on now over 110 professional rugby players, including recently some of our women players. Uh, but this report covers a consecutive uh, cohort of 97 players operated up until 2019. Um, you can see that most of the players are undergoing surgery in the second half of their careers with 80% um, being forwards and over half of the players being in the front row. Uh, these are the outcome measures in this study with the primary measure being return to play uh, independently confirmed through match lists and reports. The indications for surgery are much the same as they would be for our general spinal practice, um, apart from two important considerations. The first is the rapid onset of severe motor weakness. And it's not unusual for this weakness to be um, associated with little or sometimes no radicular pain, giving the impression of a benign natural history. However, without prompt intervention, many of these players uh, will be left with career ending motor deficits. The other consideration are players who are prevented from training and playing due to recurrent painful sensory radiculopathies, which uh, in the game are typically referred to as stingers. So uh, in this study, nearly 90% of the players underwent posterior surgery, and most of these uh, interventions were microforaminotomies with uh, smaller numbers of pure microdiscectomies and some combined uh, procedures. Not surprisingly, uh, the commonest operative levels are at C5-6 and at C6-7. And the basic surgical outcomes have been encouraging um, with a typical length of stay of, of one day or less. Of course, uh, posterior procedures may be undertaken as a day case, but many of the players have traveled considerable distances for their surgery. And I've preferred to discharge them on the morning after surgery, uh, along with all of the uh, anterior procedures. So in assessing the return to play, we have excluded those players who clearly stated their intention to retire before undergoing the surgery. And this was usually uh, because they were having surgery to deal with a neurological deficit that might uh, impact on their everyday life after retirement. Two players uh, were lost to uh, follow up. So of the 89 players intending to return, the return to play rate was 89%. Uh, 
10 players have subsequently undergone uh, further procedures, either on the contralateral side or at other levels in the net. And an important point to make when counseling these players is that the return to play rate for second procedures drops to 60%. Um, which I think reflects the accumulating burden of uh, degenerative changes in the neck. The timing of surgery is of interest. Um, in season peak uh, here in December, and I think that reflects uh, problems that started in the previous season and then respond to rehabilitation over the summer months uh, only to relapse in the first few weeks of the season. Uh, conversely, um, players uh, will often persevere with conservative management uh, towards the end of the season um, and this leads to a, a peak of activity during the summer months. Uh, now, these variations um, uh, impact on the assessment of the time from surgery to the recorded return to match play. So, for example, uh, a player operated on in February uh, might not return to play until a pre-season match in August. Uh, but on the other hand, you could have a player uh, I'd say with a painful sensory radiculopathy, but no motor deficit to recover, um, who might be ready to return within eight to 10 weeks uh, in season. Um, despite the, the variations, we uh, try to follow a structured post-operative rehabilitation regime for players undergoing posterior surgery, which you can see uh, set out here with a typical return to play around about 10 to 12 weeks. And it's often the motor deficit which uh, is the uh, determining factor. So uh, in summary, the predominant problem we now face with professional rugby players is the development of this distinct pathophysiological entity, hypertrophic cervical spondylopathy. Its main uh, clinical manifestation is of lower cervical radiculopathies um, affecting forwards and particularly the front row. The immediate uh, results of the surgery are good with an 89% planned return to play rate. But in the same month that the Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee of the House of Commons has launched an inquiry into head injury in sport, perhaps we should also be considering the effects of contact sport on the necks of those uh, dedicated young athletes. Thank you uh, very much for listening. Ed, unfortunately, you are muted. Thanks for an amazing talk, Rick. Fantastic. Um, certainly a good concept there of hypertrophic spondylotic um, cervical spondylosis. Um, I'm just thinking it's akin to sort of a spear tackler spine, I suppose, in a in an American football. I know Vaccaro um, coined that term, so we're sort of the, the, the British equivalent, I expect. Um, <laughs> There's some questions coming in. Um, we've got one from Rajat Verma. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Any role for uh, roots injections or cervical epidural injections in these cases? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, mostly uh, therapeutically, uh, I have to say. Um, there are occasions when you might be uncertain about the uh, clinical level and then I think uh, uh, root blocks uh, also have a sort of diagnostic role. Um, but I, I make use of uh, root blocks, uh, you know, particularly in the 
conservative management. Um, I'm just trying to think back in this series. I, I, I recall it's over 50% of these players going on to be operated on will have had root blocks done before the surgery. And they're, they're, they're a very, very useful way of, say, tidying a player over. Uh, you know, I, I showed you that sort of uh, lag at the end of the season, and you'll often find that players will be having a root block just to get them through to the, you know, the semi-final of this or the last match of the season, and then they <laughs> they, they limp in for their surgery in uh, in the middle of May. So absolutely. Um, I you kind of answered it. Adam Way was asking, do you feel a return to rugby is different depending on upon anterior versus posterior approaches? Yes, I think um, you can get players back more quickly with a posterior approach, particularly if they don't have a major motor deficit to recover. Um, now, most of my anterior approaches will involve a disc replacement. Um, I get them back into uh, non, obviously non-contact training um, and strength and conditioning work very quickly after disc replacement. Um, I'm, I'm cautious about um, how quickly they load up. Um, I haven't got any evidence for this, but you sense that with a disc replacement, you're probably looking for some sort of potentially osseo integration with the end plate. And maybe you're looking at some strengthening of the, uh, the end plate bone. So um, I, I'd probably wait till around about three months before they start loading up their necks. So they're going to be a little bit slower with um, the anterior approaches. I think that's the case. Uh, would you do any assessment like CT to evaluate that um, subchondral sclerosis to, to evaluate the bony integration? No, I haven't, Ed. Um, what I do um, is, you know, get the standard flexion extension views to check the uh, functioning of the disc replacement. And I think one of the concerns with disc replacement is this, um, you know, the worry about starting to get um, heterotopic bone formation around the disc replacement and losing function. Um, I, I certainly saw that. Uh, using the um, prestige uh, disc replacement, I mean, probably where I was originally involved in the in the development of the prestige, and I think the, the low profile prestige is is you know is biomechanically quite a good disc replacement, but I've seen ossification taking place around it, and that led me to uh, I now use the M6 disc replacement and. Um, so far, I've found that the incidence of um, uh, bone formation seems to be much less. But what I'm doing is, is monitoring the player with disc replacements um, with uh, flexion extension views, and then just um, a single uh, lateral x-ray looking for ossification, the sort of beginning end of the season. But you know, not not CT unless it's needed for some sort of you know clinical uh, clinical issue or problem. There's lots and lots of questions coming in. Just one to follow on from that. David Bell's asking if a patient is myelopathic, do you fuse or use arthroplasty, and is arthroplasty safe in contact sports? Um, yes, um, I have yet to see. Uh, I'm touching wood now. I've yet to see uh, any of the arthroplasties that I have used uh, fail in any any form at all, other than just simply stiffening up a bit with with bone formation. Um, um, I've had quite a number of patients involved in, you know, even high velocity car accidents, obviously restrained with seat belts, and you're worried that something might displace, and I, I've just not seen it. Um, so I think I think they're safe, and I think they are durable. Um, I was quite cautious about moving into disc replacement, particularly for the rugby players with the contact sport. But I think um, you know, along with several colleagues who uh, I, I'm aware use these disc replacements, you know, so far it, it, it seems to be going okay. <laughs> 
So I, I think we can certainly say to the players that it's safe. Yeah. Okay, so um, just straying, so I've got a few more minutes. There's a lot, a lot of questions. Um, Neil Orphan is asking, is it a time for changes to scrums in children's rugby uh, regarding the developing spine? Uh, yes, yes. And um, I think we have to look seriously about uh, the effect of uh, scrummaging in the professional game. It's quite, it's quite interesting if you, if you talk to some of the older players and then the current generations. I mean, I think a striking uh, piece of data I got was that um, the force being generated by a modern pack is now twice that of the pre, you know, if you go back to say 96, something like that, you know, the Will Carling uh, uh, squad, which, you know, pretty reasonable scrum, you're now looking at at least twice the force going through the front row in a, in a scrummaging position. Um, and you can see from that series the, the impact that it's having. I mean, over half of the players are in the front row. Uh, and it, it just must be the force that's being generated. Quite a lot of the um, uh, front row players that I talk to um, say that um, the change in the scrummaging rules at the engagement is resulting in, in more sustained force. Um, and from that point of view, they actually feel that there's a greater load on their necks than there was before the change. So uh, the thing is, uh, I, I, you know, I can't see us changing the nature of the game and going away from competitive scrummaging. So it's difficult to know quite how we manage that. Okay, so next is one from John Leach. Um, so what's your approach to advising a player with significant canal stenosis, a uh, radiological type core, but no cord symptoms? Is there an instance of central core type injury in front row forwards? Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. Um, I think this is implying someone who is uh, playing and is asymptomatic um, but uh, perhaps is found to have a, a degree of congenital stenosis. Um, and that does happen. And in fact, it's, it's, it's not uncommon in the players from sort of Pacific Island ethnic backgrounds. They seem to have a, a cervical stenosis. Um, it's interesting that the professional players in France um, all have MRI scans. Um, some years ago, they used to be done intermittently. I think they're now having routine cervical MRI scans. Um, some of my colleagues online at the moment might be able to confirm that, but I think that's the case. And that really throws up all sorts of difficulties. If, if, if you have someone with, uh, you know, a player with a degree of cervical stenosis, but, but, no, but, it, but it's asymptomatic, um, what do you do about it? Um, my basic philosophy is um, we should really avoid um, over-treating and over-medicalizing scans. Um, and I'm, I'm much more inclined to let players now uh, play with a degree of asymptomatic cervical stenosis. Um, okay. I think, I think I, I, there's, a, you know, there's a natural concern about a catastrophic injury, but I, I just don't think that they uh, run into problems with that central cord syndrome. And well, we, get worried, we get worried about it in non-elite players with people with tight cords. So yes. if elite players can do it, then we shouldn't be worried, perhaps. Just going to mark about two questions from Neil Davison and John Leach. So after clinical radiological assessments, uh, we know that some players with acute motor deficits and chronic foraminal symptoms recover well with conservative treatments. How do you select players for surgery and is there a role for nerve conduction studies? Um, yes, you're absolutely right. They, they can recover, um, but it's, it's really quite unpredictable. Um, and what I've 
what I've done over the years is to sort of steadily, shall I say, change the threshold for surgery, which I think is is different in elite athletes to uh, members of the general public, as it were. Um, and for me, the, the red flags with the motor deficit are if the player is rapidly losing power, if they're dropping below 50% of their baseline or their contralateral power, and that's happening, happening quickly, um, if there's any evidence of muscle wasting or fasciculation, um, you, you can feed in the neurophysiology and you can look for the extent of the denervation uh, on the EMG. But interestingly, I don't think that often tells you much more than your clinical observations and your examination. And now with those, you know, shall we call them motor red flags, I, I would step in really very early. Um, I'm, I'm quite prepared to offer a player surgery within the sort of traditional six week threshold if they've got those red flags. I think there's a couple of interesting things here. It seems to me that the, there's something particularly vulnerable about the C7 root. Um, and if you end up with a significant C7 motor deficit, which is going to affect your, obviously, triceps function, um, that, that will take a forward out of, out of the game. That's career ending. A back might cope with it. A forward won't. Um, okay. I think the other, so, sorry, carry on. Ed. Well, as I say, it's a really popular session. Um, I think um, Henry's allowing us a few more minutes because there's no one directly following on. There are two other rooms happening at the moment. So if you do, if you do need to leave, that's fine. But we're going to carry on just for a few more minutes. A um, couple of questions, one from me, uh, prompted by one of the questions. You, met, you mentioned unilateral and convertible um, enlargements. Do you ever see bilateral? And also, um, it, is it related to the side of the scrum the player is on due to the head rotation? Is, is there a relationship there? Uh, it's a good, good question. Uh, yes, you definitely see uh, bilateral um, and occasionally um, I'll undertake uh, bilateral microforaminotomies at the same level. And as you saw from my slides, it's, it's not that rare to do a two-level procedure. Um, I think... Um, and I've yet to do the analysis of this, uh, but I think um, the stenosis rates are probably slightly higher on the left side. And that's because most, most players will be right-sided dominant. They will go into their tackles um, using their right shoulder. So as they, as they take the contact, I think they're going over, they're tending to go more into left lateral flexion. Um, and um, I think when, when we looked at some of this data maybe a couple of years ago, uh, there's, a, there's a suggestion of laterality depending on whether it's the tight head or the loose head prop. So I, I, yes, I, I think there may be something in this, in the loading of the neck being asymmetrical. One final question, um, Tony Bateman. Uh, is lumbar pathology an injury common in rugby players? Um, it, it, it happens. Um, it, <laughs> it's interesting, it is, if you look at our general spinal practice, I and mean, I, I guess for most of it, it's probably, what, 80% lumbar, 20% neck. Um, yeah. In rugby players, it's the other way around. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, they do get lumbar discs, of course, but maybe less than you might imagine. Well, on that note, thank you very much for an excellent talk. It's certainly been thought-provoking, uh, seen by all the questions coming in. And uh, once again, thank you. Okay, Ed, thanks very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting there. And you. Bye.